You didn't do a you didn't do a check on. We are live. There we are. Hi, folks. Welcome to our Saturday Night Live. Question for topic tonight is uh, veneers. I'm going to give you some ideas, but then you can ask anything you want. I don't think we had a whole lot of questions come in on this topic, so might not be of high enough interest or. Maybe you just haven't figured out what you can do with it. Now I'm going to help you with that. Do you have a question, Frank, to start off with? Yeah. You warmed up. Jerry Gillette in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Hey, Jerry. He says, what is the thickest shop-made veneer you would recommend using? Well, I don't know if there's a, if there's a limit. In fact, I don't know. Somebody should look that up. Can you look that up, Chris? What is veneer? See if there's a thickness where it no longer becomes veneer. I don't, I don't know if there is. I, I like I like having something thick enough that it, uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't crumble on you. Here's and this is probably the thickest stuff I have. So here is some fiddleback ash, and I'm just going to tell you how thick it is. In fact, I'll give you a few samples. You get some stuff today, in particular, the older stuff tends to be thicker. So this is. 75 thou, what's that translate into? Uh, Have I got that one that has the... Uh, huh? 62 to 16. And what did you say it was? 75? Yeah. So it's better, yeah, than a, it's better than a 16th, which is really nice. I can't see any downside to it. It's nice to be able to handle. And then if you compare that to... That's what I meant to do. So here's some burl. So that's 50 thou. That's pretty thick, too. Here's some white oak. Oh, now that's only 23 thou. So that's really thin. I mean, don't, you don't have a whole lot of material to work with there. If you're careful, it doesn't matter, but especially if you get some stuff that uh, has a lot of figure in it, and it, it, as it dries, it gets wiggly. You got to spray it with some a fine mist of water and easily flatten it or carefully flatten it out. No, actually, we can talk a little more about that. I would say uh, much less than a, uh, on shop made veneer, much less than a sixteenth, and you're probably there's no room for error. Your blade wiggles a little bit when you're cutting it. You're you're in trouble. What was the last thing that? I, well, no, that was, I didn't cut those. What's the last thing that I actually cut the veneer on? <coughs> Do you remember? Wasn't on that. Oh, right here. No, that's not true either. Or yes, it is. I cut I cut this veneer out of one piece, and that stuff is really thick. I probably three sixteenths. Chris, did you get an answer? That's a strong eighth. So veneer uh, up to that eighth inch. Interesting. Stay on the heavy side. I can't. I can't think of any reason why I would be any. Th I want to be any thinner. Next, Frick. Next one comes from Sean Grumbles in Rhode Island. Do we know Sean? Ignore. 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 Right. Next. <laughs> he says, "How do you veneer large pieces without a vacuum?" How do you veneer large pieces without a backing? Vacuum. Oh, Va without a vacuum. Oh, vacuum. I was all set to say this. Actually, this this stuff has a backing. Uh, I'll 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 see. It's poplar on the back side. It's crotch walnut on the front. Without a vacuum. Um, well, I've done it before because I, we didn't make. I've we didn't have that vacuum press until a few years ago. You can make a vacuum press easy enough. I've done that. It's just some. Uh, just some heavy poly, what's it called? Polyethylene. Polyethylene and a hot melt glue gun to seal it. Problem is, it doesn't last very long. Doesn't I mean, six mil, I think, is the thickest stuff you can get locally at the hardware stores. And it doesn't take long before it gets holes punctured in it. But then I would just take the hot melt glue gun ground, fix the holes. And then I used to just use an old compressor I had, an old va uh, compressor off a off a refrigerator 
and put a hose on the intake and you have to keep it running but it would draw it would draw enough of a vacuum that it would it would work if you don't have that then you get the it's the expense of having multiple sheets of mdf and just keep you know if you had a very large surface you have to get quite a few sheets of mdf which is what i like to use and that'll spread out or spread the pressure enough so when you put clamps on it you don't have to have five million clamps so you figure the pressure from a clamp goes out at a 45 degree angle on both sides so if you're clamping if you're clamping the veneer on and you just literally had two pieces of veneer and tried to squeeze it together you would lift, literally have to have a clamp on all the surfaces or the entire surface because 45 degrees from that doesn't go very far but if you sa start sandwiching it between layers of layers of mdf yeah i got a couple pieces here another piece If you laid that up so that there's your veneer and you got a sheet of MDF and then another sheet of MDF and now when your clamp goes on if we can Jake have you got a sharpie I got a red pen but I guarantee it won't work I need glasses. That's so, yeah. so 45 degrees. Did I call that? There it is. At a 45 degree angle, you've got a clamp sitting here, and then your next clamp can be there. And if you stack on another piece, it, the overlap is even greater. So the more layers you can put on, the fewer clamps you're going to need, although you can't put too few clamps because you want some pressure on there. Anyways, I've done that numerous times. So just multiple layers. We, <coughs> we used to have a, or there is a particle board plant not far away. And a few years ago, you could buy second stuff that the, when they put the melamine on there, it didn't quite match you know, whatever happened. And you can go buy and buy. And I used to buy sheets of that just for that one purpose is make is for veneering large panels so that you could just have multiple s layers and didn't cost a fortune. But a vacuum press is so much easier. So let me, let me, uh, oh, by the way, tonight's episode is sponsored by 757 Life. This is, this is uh, Kim O'Connor's business. So if you live anywhere near Virginia Beach, and this is one of these businesses that are supported by RC Woodworking. Chris has his on tonight, Megan has hers. Jake and Frick obviously didn't get the memo. There was no memo. There was no memo? You didn't tell us. Well, you should have known. Okay, next time. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, check Kim's business out. Stripe, this, uh, actually 757life.com. So let me, let me go through and give you a couple of examples. I'll stop every once in a while and give you an example of where you can veneer. So this was a, um, this was a writing desk, writing, not a writing desk. What did I used to call this? Yeah. Writing desk. It's made out of white oak. And, I did, and, and this is white, uh, English white oak burl. Brown. Brown oak, thank you. And I didn't have enough to do it at a solid, but I did have it in veneer form. Plus, I wanted to keep this flat because nothing worse than having this thing bow and cupping. So what I did is I took this panel. I took a piece of and quarter. Yeah, quarter inch MDF. And I, you can see right on there. I didn't, I didn't try to hide the fact. First thing I did is I glued a piece of solid white oak on the end and on this end and then I glued a piece and it's about a 5 16 of an inch thick on that side and that side and then I sandwiched it between two layers of white oak burl brown. brown oak burl keep me straight and it's I did this way back in 
1988, several years before Jake was born, two years, three years after Frick was born, and this That's how you know it's old. This has stayed flat. See that? All those years. So it's a great way to stretch pretty material. It's the best way to create stability in a lid, especially an unsupported lid like that. Unsupported meaning it's not in a frame. So there's one idea. And you can buy, if you, if you want to buy really, really uh, pretty wood, to buy it in solid form costs you a fortune. Now, I'll tell you something else too. So if I wanted to use, there's some really nice um, Claro walnut burl. But trying to work with that in solid stock would be almost impossible. There's, there's no, there's no real grain direction. It'd be all over the place. But you could take, a, you could take and do the same thing, and take advantage of how beautiful that wood is, without having to deal with the instability of a piece of burl. Because once you glue that down, it's thin enough. It's not going to uh, move or cup on you. But that you have that advantage. That leads me into this piece. So okay. we did this. <coughs> what? You said you were going to. Oh, intersperse yeah. them? Okay. <coughs> Next, Frick. Great. Uh, Sean. What? Grumbles? He whined that you didn't answer Grum enough of his question. Oh, grumbly Sean is grumbling about what? He said, How do you keep the, pe the veneer from shifting, though, when you're using that many combs? Well, um, so part of the. Br he's talking big. I'm trying to think of the biggest. The biggest thing I veneered, I think, was a king size. I did a king size bed, headboard, and footboard. So that would have been six. How, how wide is this king? Is it six or seven feet wide? I think it's six I think feet. It's six, I, think it's I think it's six feet by seven feet. Yeah. So this headboard would have been seven feet. Well, by the time you did everything, close to seven feet wide. And it was probably four feet. So the first thing you're going to have to do is there's no way you're going to be able to put glue, regular glue on there. So you have to use a, uh, something that has a, a slow setup time, which is usually going to be, I always used a boat glue, which was a two-part water and plastic resin. And so that gave you about an, uh, an hour's worth of uh, working time. You get everything spread, and then what I did usually did is I would just tape it. So if I was if I was veneering onto something, I would after the glue is on, go in and take some. I wouldn't use that stuff. I wouldn't use this stuff either. But I haven't got any of my thin green, yellow, and I would just tape that in place in enough places that it would stay put. Now, you don't ever want to be having to rely on that being right there. So everything would be slightly oversized. So after the fact, I could go in and clean it all up. But tape is, tape is enough to hold it in place. And then just the, the surface area, you're talking about a great big piece. There's enough surface area and tack with the glue that it's most likely not going to move on you. But when you do clamp, I'll show you that too. I learned that one the hard way. <coughs> when you apply your clamps, I would always make sure that when I put the clamp on there that I, I push down on this. Because if that's on an angle and you tighten it, it's going to want to skirt like that and it'll, it'll shift something. So when I put the clamp on, I put the clamp on, I, I hold the flat surface tight, bring that up, and then snug it up from down there. And that's going to minimize any shifting, slight shifting that would take place if you don't do that. So tape the edges, use the right glue, and make sure when you put your clamps on that you line everything up and keep the flat spot flat before you start to tighten it so it's not inching one way or the other. That make him happy? Sean, I hope you're happy now. Next, Frick. Uh, Steve D. from Centralville, Virginia. Hi, Steve. What are the optimum storage conditions for a veneer? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, if it dries out, it cracks. 
So Jake, you want to spin the camera around? Focus up there. I've got, I've got two, uh, two caches of veneer in here. This one up here is all the long stuff. So that I've got mahogany, walnut, cherry, ash, birch. Think of anything else I got up there? I got some sycamore. And I just lay that like that. I got it. I got it for nothing. So it's not like I have a whole lot invested in it. And I just why not keep it in the exact same environment that you're going to be working in? So I've I've never done anything different. But the problem is that that's been moved multiple times from different shops, and just handling it, you got to be really careful. I mean, you, you go to pick this thing up and it splits. Uh, oftentimes they'll have the ends. If you can see that piece of walnut up there, where they'll tape the end to keep the split to keep the end from splitting. There's a lot of waste in veneer. It's not like a solid piece of lumber. You usually end up having to cut around defects. And like I said, if you got it and it's really wrinkly, see, I've got another little stash right here. And this is where I keep my prettier stuff. This is all the, uh, and then a lot of it is small pieces. That's some crotch walnut. Again, with it's got a, it's a double, it's a, you know, it's got a backing piece of poplar on the back. So if you're going to use that, you'd have to use it inside of a frame. Otherwise, you'd be looking at the poplar edge on there. What else have I got in here? A lot of this stuff has got the double backing on it just because it's thin and, and it's, uh, stuff that has a tendency to get really if you just if you tried to leave a piece like that just alone without a backing on it this area gets all wrinkly and it's really hard to work with but I have found that if you just spritz it put some water on it and let the water soak in and then I clamp it between I just as it as it gets wet it gets pliable and I clamp it between two pieces of that blue paper towel and a couple pieces of MDF and then the paper towel will help wick some of the water out. And over, I don't know, a day or two, it, uh, it'll flatten it out nicely. And it's thin enough that it, I mean, it'll, it'll lose all that moisture you've added to it rather quickly. But at least this gets it flat so that you can work with it. I wouldn't take it out, I wouldn't take it out of the clamp and then wait six months before you use it again because it'll go right back to that wiggly place. But if you wet it, Clamp it flat between some paper towel and sometimes I had to go in and change paper towel a few times too And then you take it out and it's nice and flat and you get it clamped in place and You're good to go If you don't wet it and you try to flatten it out, it'll split Anyway, so as far as storage go, I don't I don't do anything in particular. There's probably people that uh, people that um, Are really serious about this on an industrial level that would control the environment But I just have it where I'm where I'm working I wouldn't store it outside. You don't want uh, high moisture areas. Max Frick? Uh, <clears throat> Sherwood R in the chat. Hi, Sherwood. He says, can veneer be made from any wood? Well, I don't see why not. I mean, remember, when we say veneer, all we're doing is talking about wood that is relatively thin. So as long as you can have a, a, a way of cutting it and it doesn't... Uh, move on you terribly when you're trying to do it so i think uh, you can do it on anything uh, however why why do it on something that if you're not if it's if it's not advantageous so typically what you do you want to use it for is when you got a really pretty piece of wood and you want to stretch it so here's an example if you look at the uh, stretchers if you look at the stretch on my bench down here so that's some really nice bird's eye well that would be a shame to use a two inch thick by eight inch wide solid piece of bird's eye maple that would be criminal especially bird's eye like that because look at how much more you can get out of it so if you look real closely there's a joint line right here and if you went up underneath there's nothing done down there so you would see so this is a piece of maple that has had bird's eye veneer added to it or glued to it on both sides and this stuff was a sixteenth of an inch thick and then capped off on the top 
so that you get to see it and you just really stretch your material. Like I said, I didn't bother to cap the bottom side because it's down underneath and nobody sees it. Now I did the same thing up here as well. I made this stuff. There's a, there's a, there's a solid piece of maple, but it's bird's eye in there. So I just faced it and I wasn't trying to hide anything. I was just you know, getting as much out of my material as I could. What was the question? Can you use any wood? Oh yeah, you can use any wood. So let me introduce what we're doing here. We do this every second Saturday night, make myself available to answer questions to support our Purple Heart project. I don't know what I'm pointing at. Your microphone's covered. I'd like telling you. Put it on the outside. Is there anybody that doesn't know? I'm just going to ask that question in case I'm saying something. I'm singing to the choir here, or preaching to the choir. We, six times a year, we bring in seven combat wounded veterans from all over the world. We've had them as far away as Australia, Ireland, and, and uh, Denmark. And we treat them to a six-day, very intense hand tool workshop, essentially teaching them the skills they would need to build a piece of furniture as if it was 200 years ago. We cover airfare, hotel, meals, actually not hotel anymore. We, ha we actually house them right here on premises. And we provide the meals right here. Every vet goes home with $4,000 worth of tools. Our bench brigade, thanks to Jack Lane and, and, uh, and Jim Rossetti up here in Moncton and, and a host of volunteers, we actually have a bench built to our spec and delivered to them at their home so they can continue to do this. It costs a lot of money. I think the current estimate is somewhere around $350,000 a year to do. Um, so we need your help, but it's also an opportunity for you to help, for you to participate in this. So we've made our selection for the first four classes. First class is a month from now. Month from now, month, or five weeks. Five. I, think, I think it's five weeks. So middle of April will be our first class. They'll come in on a Sunday. We'll have a meet and greet. We start Monday morning working hard, and uh, we finish the following Saturday night, and then we take them back to the airport on Sunday morning. And we'll all, we always broadcast on the Thursday night of the actual class and get you, give you a chance to meet some of the folks that, have, that are in the class. And there's various things on here. A lot of these dovetails have been, have been produced by wounded vets in the class that stunned me on how good they were. We also have s seven spots in each class reserved for uh, civilian students. Or actually, they don't need to be civilian, but non scholarship students who come as a paying customer to be part of the class. So a cl full class is 14. We always have one wounded vet from a previous class come back. The, uh, the uh, Sean and Sean Chim is going to be here in April. Sean McDermott. We've got several. We'll have six in this year. And what else can I tell you about it? Am I, mis am I missing anything? It's a great time. It's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. We work long hours, 7.30 in the morning till usually 10, 10.30 at night for six days. And it's, uh, guys come out being able to produce stuff like this. And I'll show you something. This is a student I just had here last week. His name was Ben. Now, he wasn't a combat wounded vet, but here's what you can have. Here's what can you, produce, you can produce when you have the right tools and the right instruction. So this was, uh, Ben spent three days. See enough of that? There's a half blind, pine and walnut. And here's another through dovetail walnut and poplar. Take a really close look because they're instructed to put this together right from the saw, meaning there's no pairing. You mark it, you cut it, you assemble it with glue one time, one time only. We do not permit test fits. That's not part of our program. If you're interested in that, I have something to announce. On July, do we have the date? Ow. I don't think so. Yeah, we do. I just can't remember it. It's the first week of July, Frick? I have no idea what you're talking about. That a boy. <coughs> He's dance. What? He's dance class. No, this isn't the advanced class. This is another class that we're going. This is a three-day class. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's going to be the first, I think it's the first Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in July. It'll be announced here shortly. 
we're just working on it. Jake will pull it up for me while I'm talking about it. It's going to be an opportunity. It's going to be called a Dovetail Mastery Workshop. There will be 14 spots, and it'll run from 7 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night for three days. And you will master through dovetails and half-blind dovetails. So what I just showed you, there's no reason why you can't pull off something like this. Now, you may think that's pie in the sky. Well, come, we'll have some pie in the sky. You'll be able to do it. And what can I tell you? The details for that will go up on our site soon, this week. We just shot the promotional video for it the other day, and Luther's got the write-up all ready to go. I just got to preview it one last time, and I think it's, it's good to, uh, it'll be good to release. So if you've always wanted to cut dovetails, and you're sitting there thinking, oh, I'd love to be able to do that, come and do it. Come and do it. Now, that was a bit of a commercial. Another question, Frick? Oh, uh, yeah. Paul Laws in the chat. Hi, Paul. He says, does the process of cutting veneer vary according to the species of stock being used? Does the process of veneer... Of cutting. Of cutting veneer, depending on the species. Does it, does it change much? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I've cut veneer... I cut my own veneer in walnut and in cherry. And... Sure, I've done it in white oak. As far as domestic hardwoods, I don't think you're going to have to vary anything. The only time the only time you're going to get into a, a, a strange situation is when you're cutting it in some burl or anything like that. Then you just have to be really careful, and you have, you want to have if you're doing the bandsaw, the bandsaw blade has to be sharp, and you have to have it tracking properly. We did a YouTube video on that, on how you can set your fence so that it perfectly matches the way your blade cuts. Not all, not every time will a blade cut true to the fence, and you can you can uh, correct that. It's a good sharp blade. Make sure your blade tension is is proper. You don't want it allowing it to bow on you in the middle. I've had that happen in the past, but I I, I don't think there's any problem, and I don't think if there's any treatment other than sharp blade and a fence that is properly that is parallel to the cutting path of the blade. I'll often use a thin kerf rip on the table saw and uh, I've, you can reach three inches on a 10 inch blade. So make one pass, flip it over, make another pass and then go over to your bandsaw and just cut the little section out of the middle or finish the little section in the middle. Sometimes trying to bandsaw through uh, eight inches of wood is uh, not everybody's bandsaw is up to that task. But And you got to be careful with your feed rate too. You want to keep good pressure. You want to make sure that you don't allow the board to drift away from your fence. Always want to keep the piece you're cutting between the blade and the fence. And when I say feed feed rate, um, you got to you want to you want your saw to be cutting, but you don't want it bogging down. So you can tell when you're you can tell just by the sound of the the RPM of the machine if you're pushing it too hard. The other problem if you push too hard is that's when the blade starts to want to follow the path of least resistance. If you go relatively slow, it'll just keep cutting on that line, but you push too hard, it's going to start looking for areas to the left or the right that are a little easier to cut, so bear that in mind. Good question. Next, Frick. Uh, Gary Nellis Woodworking. Hi, Good Gary. Chat. He says, after you've sliced a veneer on the bandsaw, do you smooth the bandsaw on surface yep. before or after gluing it to the substrate? That's a really good question. So um, I always like, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to smooth the piece when it's thick than when it's thin. So I will plane one side, put that against the fence, slice it off, and then plane that sawn side, not the sawn side of the veneer, but the sawn side of the board and before I slice the next piece off. It's always easier to glue the piece on, smooth side in, and then finish plane it or surface that get rid of the mill marks once it's already attached to the piece. Now you've, you've got some backing. But you can also do this too. I mean, I, I do this frequently. Take a... Uh, Take a piece of, uh, we use one inch MDF on our benches. 
So I've got lots of uh, decent sized scrap as a result of that, which makes it great because I, I like using it for stuff I'm just like I'm about to show you. I'm gonna move some of this out of the way and see if I can't demonstrate a way of holding veneer. I gotta talk about these, but I'll put them over here for now. So I've got a piece of, I mean this stuff is relatively thick, but as thick as this is, I couldn't put that in between two bench dogs and try to plane it because it would, it would just bow and move. So instead, I'm gonna take a piece of MDF. I've, I've put a, and we sell this stuff because I use a lot of it. I, uh, I have a piece of self-adhesive sandpaper on here. Can you hand me that? It's gonna be dusty. Now, put that piece on here and there's, there's enough friction. There's enough friction that I can plane this. Now, that, uh, that's a brand new plane. So I'm gonna close the throat. We're kind of a little bit off topic, but it's all right, it's all applicable. Hello blade, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna close that throat down. So that means loosening the frog retaining screws on either side, using the one in the middle to move the blade forward, move the frog forward, sorry. Now because of the way they're made, that frog sits on a ramp. So you have to uh, adjust and then pull your blade back in and then adjust again, meaning move it forward. Now this one's not meeting, it's not meeting the uh, opening perfectly square. So I'm gonna be limited in how far, how, how tight I can get it, but that'll work. Lock that down. Now, if you're interested, what I would do with this, like I said, we just took this out of the box. I would go in and I would, I would adjust, I would actually file the opening, the throat, to match that gap. Did you, Jake, I had a piece of, wa I had a wax here. Did you yeah. see it? Thank you. <coughs> so I'm gonna plane this. Hopefully we've got the green direction right. Now, I don't have this long enough. Shoot. I'm going to add a piece on. What grid is that, 220? Mm, 230. No, it's 225. You're way off. Set that on there. And without having to have worry about that crumbling up on me in the end, I can go in and plane that near. I got a good flat, sturdy surface underneath. The Dovetail Mastery Workshop is the 22nd to the 24th of July. It's July. a Monday, Monday to Wednesday. Now, because of the way this holds, I could do this with really thin veneer too. It doesn't have to be thick like that. That's the best way I know of to 
go in there and clean that surface up. It's the only way I know that you can actually hold it and do it this way. So, I don't know, you can't tell, but it's rough on the underside, and now it's smooth on the top. So that's the best, that is the best way to handle prepping your veneer and getting it smooth enough to use after you've cut it off the bandsaw or the table saw. Next, Frick. Actually, let me, let me introduce another one of these. So this was a bloke box, man's jewelry box. We didn't want to call it that. So one of my friends in Australia came up with the name. I had a piece of wall, not solid wall, not this. Just had some, had some nice crotch figure in it. So I wanted to do something a little bit different for the fronts. Do you want to come in close on this, Jake? So I had a flitch, F L I T C H. So when they take, I have a log here, bird's eye log somewhere. When they. Moose, that's got to be the most uncomfortable chair. When they take a big log like that, so that's a bird's eye maple log. You can see the bird's eyes, they come right through. See that? See all these little, look like pock marks? That's bird's eyes. So if that had gone to the mill and they sliced it, they would make sure that they kept that all in order. And what's nice about the way they do veneer, there's no waste because it's being sliced with a knife, not with a saw. So then when you get it, all of these pieces are kept in sequence. And, and one piece looks exactly like the other and you just slowly see little, uh, little uh, characteristics change as it goes down through. So I had a bunch of this. So what I did is I took, we'll say sheet number one, two, and three. This is sheet number one. This is sheet number two. This is sheet number three. And I made the drawer. I used sycamore on the sides. For any particular reason? Just because I had it and I liked it. This is a piece of black walnut. You can see the difference in color. But I veneered. I don't know if you can see the glue joint. You might be able to right there. I veneered the front, and then I took, the piece was wide enough, I didn't bend it, I glued the piece on, actually I think I glued this piece on first. So I took a strip and I glued that on the top of the drawer front, and then I glued the second, and then I put, glued this piece on, so it looks like the grain comes up and over the top. And then I took the next piece, and I did the exact same thing on this one. So it comes up and over the top. It looks, it just, a, you can't do that with anything else. If you look at that, if you can see that right on the camera, it just looks really interesting. And then, like I said, I took, I took that back piece. Now that's a piece of solid walnut, black walnut. You can tell by the difference in the color. And I glued a thin strip up along there. And then I did the same thing. I glued the front piece on and it would just up, up and over. So you look at this, you go from here to here, back to there. So these are all things that you can do with veneer that you can't do, well you can do with solid wood, but like I said, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't cut a drawer front out of a solid piece of burl because there's just no stability whatsoever. So you do employ techniques like that and it opens up all kinds of possibilities. Here's another little, I'll save that, we'll do another one. Next question, Frick. Um, Tim, Tim Creighton in the chat says, what are some preferred sources for veneer? What are some preferred sources? I don't know if he means like where you can buy some. Oh, or you know what? I'm sorry. I don't know. All of, all of this stuff that I got came from uh, Dale Nish when I was at BYU. And Dale had tons of it, more than they would ever use. So he, when I left, graduate, he said, take whatever you want. So... I brought a bunch of it back at a great big U-Haul. But I don't, um, I know I know Woodcraft sells small bundles, but I mean, do a Google search on there and you'll find places that'll sell veneer f for you. 
they, I mean, slicing it is more advantageous than sawing it because of what I said, you don't, you don't lose any. So if I had sawn this, then the difference between this piece and this piece would be the thickness of the saw blade plus the amount of material that would be required to clean up that surface and to clean up that surface. When it's sliced with a knife, that surface is only the thickness of this away from this surface. So now, now I got another sequ sequential one to talk to you about. Next, Frick. How are anybody on tonight? Uh, yeah, we got over 400. Hi, uh, 400. Ron Best in the chat says, how Hi, do you Ron. use veneer for edge? I think he spelled it wrong. I don't know if he means banding or bending. Edge, edge banding. banding? Yeah. Ask the question again. How do you use veneer for edge banding? Um, well... How do you use veneer for edge banding? The only, uh, the only problem you're going to encounter is uh, you've got to make sure that whatever you're, whatever you're banding is at the size or very close to the size that you need because you apply on a, uh, a 32nd of an inch of veneer, you don't have room to go in there and remove any amount to fit it. So the only thing is to be really careful. For instance, when I put this piece of veneer on top of here, that would be called edge banding. I had to make sure that that, um, that that drawer front was actually sitting a little bit below the drawer side. So when I glued that on, I didn't have to take much off of this in order to flush up that joint. So you just have to be aware that all of a sudden you don't have a lot of freedom when it comes to removing excess material. So simple question would be be carefully and the more specific would be make sure whatever your edge banding is essentially uh, at the finished width or size so that your edge band is just going on there for appearance. You don't have much you can remove. Next, Rick. Uh, next one's from Lance G in the chat. He says, what makes you decide hey, to use a veneer over any alternatives? What? Say that again. Basically, what makes you decide to use a veneer over any oh. alternatives? Well, this is the best example. When you're dealing with wood like this, which is burl, it's got lots, tons of figure, um, in, solid, in solid form, it's a very unstable piece of wood. There is no grain direction. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to put that on for a drawer front, it's going to expand this way, it's going to expand that way, all over the place. And because it doesn't have any grain direction, it doesn't have any structural strength. But it is beautiful. So that's why I would take a piece of unstable but highly figured wood and glue that to a stable piece of wood, and now you have the best of both worlds. That's the simplest and the best answer I can give you. Next. Uh, John Root in the chat says, do you do anything different when gluing up thicker veneer, say an eighth inch thick? Uh, no, but you know, you just made me think of something. One of the things you want to be careful of, and I, I learned a lesson hard way on this, is if on thin veneer, especially if it's a porous wood, if you use too much glue, it'll press right, it'll come right through the veneer, and then you've got glue stains on the top side of the veneer if it doesn't end up sticking to the substrate. So you can't apply, you can't apply too much. The advantage of using eighth inch is that's not going to happen, but any of the thin veneer, you really have to be careful. And uh, now that you bring up these questions, I mean, there's a lot to think about. We should take them over and show them our vacuum press. Can we do that? Do we have range? Uh, In the next building? Try. The mics have range. You could try. The mics have? So they can hear us talk and hurt it. No, we, we could give it a shot. Move the camera. Leave the, leave the doors open. All right. If I will, not, I'll I'll I will go. I will go over there. Let me give you. Let me give you one more. Uh, Let's go over there. Okay. We can't do that. We just did one. I just don't know how much of a mess it is. So I'm going to show you, Chris. Come on, you're the one that built it. Frick, tell us when. Are we still here? I lost audio. Uh, audio. Lost audio. Yeah, lost audio. Got video, no problem. 
If I stand here, can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you now. Okay, can you go over there? Yeah. So, Chris called me up one day and he said, uh, what else do you need, literally? I said, well, we can use a veneer press. So go over there, Chris. Jake, we lost video now. Yeah, you lost video. Tell me when it comes back. Uh, Have you got it? No. Uh, yeah. You got it? Okay, just stand there. So what, how thick is the film, Chris? It isn't, can you grab the mic for him, please? It's sitting right there at the end of the table saw. I'm going to gotta get the mic for Chris so he can answer some questions. There's a slight chance people could be able to build this themselves. Do a mic check. Mic check. Yeah, works good. So this is Chris. This is our uh, on-staff engineer who works he's, for somebody he's else. He's the kind of on-staff that we like. Yeah. <laughs> he works for us, and we don't pay him. <laughs> so uh, what's the thickness of the film? I think like it was 20 mil because we couldn't get the 30 mil at the time. Somewhere underneath, there's another roll of 30 mil. <laughs> So it's durable, but it's all, it already has some holes in it. And we go in and patch it with tape. And I think we've already replaced it once, but we use it a lot. So the table base was made out of aluminum, extruded aluminum. And they used what they had to make this flat. I'll tell you how good it is. So when we, we use that to make the tops, the veneer up the tops, pardon me, not veneer up, the glue up the tops for our benches. And we want those benches to be flat. So in there... We will put three sheets of one inch MDF glued together, put it in the press. We always put the top, what will be the top of the bench down plus the table. When it comes out, we guarantee it to be within 10 thou front to back, but oftentimes it's within two thou end to end. So that's over a five foot bench. It's within, it's better than two inches, two thousandths of an inch of being flat. So the frame is made up out of aluminum, and then there's two sheets of MDF, one inch MDF on there. We've got a piece of plexiglass, heavy plexiglass, but you have to put a bunch of veins in there as well. So there's veins or grooves cut along the top so that the air can be drawn out. Now on the, on the bottom right-hand side, you see a vacuum pump. Anything in about that, Chris? Where'd you get it? Uh, we got to get from uh, veneersupply.com. Veneersupply.com. That's... And, and can you explain what, what the, uh, the suction's all about? So How that do you one, measure it? That one will pull almost a, uh, a total vacuum. It's, uh, you can pull, basically remove one atmosphere. That's all there is to, to remove. You can't remove more than that. And that's equivalent to 14.7 PSI. Um, so PSI stands for pounds per square inch. So when you put something in there, you've essentially got... 15 pounds of pressure on every square inch, which is more than what you need for gluing. And that, what that's four by eight, isn't it? Yep. And that big, that big top that you see, that hinge top, that clamps in five places. But the real seal, all the way around the perimeter, there's a rubber seal that. that uh, Can't hear you. What? Can't hear you. How come? Can you now? Yep. Oh my goodness, move 16 inches. Anyway, so that creates a rubber seal and it just draws a vacuum. We leave the vacuum pump running on for the hour or so that it's in the press and that maintains the vacuum. And if you don't understand atmospheric pressure, it's cool because it puts uniform pressure everywhere over the piece. If you're using calls and clamps, you're going to have more pressure in one area than the other. This evens it all out and it's great. You put it in there, close the lid, clamp it in place, turn it on, walk away and forget about it. Um, there, you can buy big mechanical presses. I worked with one at BYU. We had one that was that size. But a big mechanical press, you have to compensate. So if you put a two foot by four foot panel in the middle, you have to build up all the rest of the area to the same thickness or else it will actually bow the platen on the clamp, which is a pain. I mean, that's a ton of work. This is by far the best way to do any kind of veneering, particularly if you're dealing with flat work. Don't tell them what it costs. Just going back to your uh, the person that asked about uh, making your if you don't have a vacuum press, uh, coincidentally that veneersupply.com sells bags oh, that you that can hook you, up to a shop make? vac that are quite economical. So if a you, shop vac, yeah. So there's, no, that, there's that route. <laughs> yeah, well, check it out. I, I haven't been on that site, but veneer veneer supply. What? 
I think it's veneersupply.com. Veneersupply.com. Maybe and veneer if, supplies. And if you use the code Chris, you get 10% <laughs> yeah. off your order. <laughs> they won't serve you. <laughs> yeah, use the code Chris said. Okay, I'll show you one more example of something that you can do. So this is some really pretty walnut crotch. So this is where the tree, the trunk of the tree branched out, became two branch, two trees. And what happens is the grain's trying to decide which, who's, which tree it's gonna go with. And that's why you get this, this what we call crotch. It's, again, it's not a very stable, it's a very unstable wood, and when it dries, it's all ripply. So what they do is they glue it onto a piece of straight grained, in this case, poplar. So if you look real close, you can see there's two layers. What's nice about that is that's literally ready to use. So the only problem is you've got the, you've got, you don't want to see the edge. So in an application like this, where I didn't want to, I didn't want the band sticking out on the top. I wanted to see just this expanse. So I had to use nothing but the veneer itself. In an application like this, you can put it into a frame. So, I mean, this is just a piece of Baltic birch, but I could have taken that Baltic, I, I should have, but I was just doing this as a, uh, we did the YouTube video on this. I could have taken a piece of this crotch veneer, glued it onto that piece of veneer, it would fit inside the groove, and then you would have had this box with that nice walnut crotch on there. I gotta cut my nails, it's disgusting. All right, next question, Frick. Running out? No. Um, we take any question you want, but if you want to lean it towards this topic. Walter, we got lots. Uh, Walter Rao in the chat. Wally up in Ontario. Hi, Wally. How do you repair veneer that has been torn out in small pieces on a tabletop? Uh, well, um, what's another no, different question? Just kidding. If it's valuable, if it belonged to your great-great-grandfather and you have to save it, then you've got a lot of work ahead of you. The veneer's missing. If you have the pieces, you can put them back in. Just gonna take a lot, it's a jigsaw puzzle. And you've gotta go in there and you've gotta fit those pieces. If there are pieces that are missing and you're trying to save it, wow. Uh, I, I mean, that would be, that would be a job by job um, evaluation. I might take all the veneer off and start over. Uh, you might have to try to make a clean cut and put in a joint. That's that's uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of work, but there's no one way of doing it because it's always going to be dependent on what you actually have. And is the substrate any good? Because if the substrate split, meaning the wood underneath. Then you got you got an even bigger problem because that's got to be repaired before you can veneer the top. So, I mean, I've seen a lot of antiques that were veneered that came apart, whether they got wet, or whatever, and you have to evaluate how much it's worth, and is it worth the amount of work it's going to take to fix it? No single answer for that. Sorry. Next, Rick. Um, Emerson Assis in. Brazil and the Hi, Emerson. What is the best tool to cut veneer uh, in brackets? You put cross cut in Brazil. A lot of super hard veneer to cut. Well, I I do most of mine with this. This is a this is a Japanese dovetail saw that I bought back in the eighties, and I don't know if you can tell, but there's a slight radius in there. So what I'll do is take this, usually set it on a piece of pine just because the pine is nice and soft, so I'm not taking a toll on the saw. And then I will clamp. Now, it's, it wouldn't be a bad idea to put a piece of tape down there as well to help hold it together. So here's an even better method of doing it. Take a piece of tape. If you guys don't have this and you can't get it locally, you should get it some from us. We go through this. We use a lot of this stuff. It's, uh, it's stiffer and stickier than regular masking tape. It's a little bit thicker by about 20%. See a mooser. So I would go in there and I would tape that up like this. And then I would clamp on something as a guide. Well here, let's actually do it. I'll turn it this way. 
clamp something on as a guide. Now this saw I'm about to use has really had the biscuit. But I can, I can come in here like this. And because of the curvature of the blade, it's not, uh, you know, the end of the blade is not catching in the wood. And then I can, I can cut that slice off. And on a cross cut, you know, you've got a nice clean cut. And just peel that off. There you go. Now, and uh, a, a, a Japanese style um, pull cut is nice because it's a lot easier than pushing when it comes to that particular application. I have no idea. There's no branding on this. There is, but it's Japanese character, so I can't tell you what it says. But it has a little bit of a radius on there, so when you're setting it down there like that, like I said, you don't have that corners digging in. That's how I've always, they, and they make it, they actually, they make a veneer saw, and it kind of looks like that too. It's got a radius bottom, and I'm pretty sure it cuts on the pole. But the tape is a really good trick. It helps hold all the fibers together so that you don't end up, you know, out here at the end, you all of a sudden you're pulling something off and it's running a big crack up the side. That's that, uh, that's that English brown oak. It's beautiful stuff. I wish I had more of that. Next, Frick. This is actually getting to be interesting. <coughs> um, Philip Lawrence. Hi, Phil. He says, how do you use veneer on corners and slopes? Oh, no, nobody's picking out our vets tonight. We've had I'm two. Who is? I'm working on it, but I'm only going to have one draw. All right. Well, we've already talked to Wally and Phil. Say it again, please, Frick. Sorry. Uh, how do you use veneer on corners and slopes? Corners and... Slopes. Slopes? That's what it says, yeah. Oh, do you know what he means, Jake? I, I, you, Philip, you're going to have to ask it again in a different way, because I don't know what you mean by corners and slopes. Well, he, he could be referring to the, the curves. Slopes could be curves. At the top of the slope. Uh, if you talk... If, if you're talking about trying to uh, veneer onto a surface that isn't flat, I'm going to guess at that. How would you do it? Well, you can, oh, you can't use a vacuum press in there. I mean, I've heard of people using bags of sand to, uh, to apply pressure. Uh, there's what's called hammer veneering, which is, uh, I've never done it, but that's where you use a hide glue, and uh, that's a process in and of itself. It's kind of messy. Uh, an irregular surface, I would say, I would probably, if I was doing it, I would probably somehow use a sandbag to lay, I mean, the sandbag will, will even out your pressure for you, but you got to make sure that whatever it is, it's supported underneath so it doesn't collapse under the weight of the sandbags. Then there's another one of those situations where it, the answer is going to be unique to the actual problem. Let me give you another, another uh, reason to use veneer. So... I don't know how many years ago. How long? How old is this chest, Jake? Ten. So ten years ago, we did a we did a work on our online workshop. We did a yes. Uh, oh, uh, I need to point. I just noticed Artis is on. Artis, Super Dave's mom. Yeah. Howdy. Always read your posts. Boy, we've got a we've got a uh, an anniversary coming up on that, don't we? June. No, wait. May. No. Oh, that's close. Um, I we did a chest of drawers, and I wanted to uh, I wanted to use this technique to make the drawer fronts really interesting. So, in the evolution of uh, woodworking. You go from learning all the different techniques and joints, and and uh, you get pa past your f you get past your fashion you get past your fascination with just very plain woods, 
and then you want to get a little bit deeper and you start exploring the really pretty woods and then you start paying attention to the design. So instead of just having a chest of drawers where the drawer, each drawer front looks like it was harvested in a different country, it's nice to have some continuity. So what we did with this, Jake, I need you to come in close. We used cherry for the drawer front, poplar for the sides and back, native cedar on the bottom. The drawer fronts were all done as a through dovetail, which is a nice fast dovetail. And then I took, I, had a, I found a nice pretty piece of cherry and I started slicing it. And I numbered it so that if you look closely, you'll see how the grain carries from one to the next to the next. And you can just, there's five drawers in this. I didn't want to bring them all downstairs. But there's five drawers and you can watch the grain just progress top to bottom. Now you can see quite clearly the joint line on the top. Although I always cut a radius there just to kind of break that joint line, but the, the two different woods oxidize differently, so you, uh, it's quite noticeable. But on the end, you, you, you don't know, I mean, if you look real close, you'll see a joint line right there, but that's not anything that would bother anybody. But you get to have that nice continuity of the grain. Okay, next, Frick. Uh, Paul Francoeur. Hi, Paul. I, know, I recognize all these names from our customers. When you veneer the bird's eye stretchers on the workbench, do you do the edges first or last, and why? Um, so when I did these, actually, I built this and then decided that's so plain and ugly looking. Went back, and I veneered. <coughs> I veneered the stretchers. This is all, by the way, on the online workshop as well. This was the first big project we did. So when I did these, my, my, uh, my line of thinking was, where are you going to notice the joint line first, or most readily? A, a joint line down here or a joint line on here? And since almost everybody looks at this from a standing position, you're going to see this. So I put the veneer on the sides first and then put the cap on. And that way you don't really see that. And by the way, there's a little radius on there. So that hides that joint as well. You don't really notice it until you get down like this and then you can see the joint line. But looking up from the top, you don't see that at all. You just see bird's eye, you see the radius and you see the bird's eye down the front. So, I mean, now that I point out to you, no, but if I didn't, you might not even have noticed that that was veneered. So I, it's like, um, oh, it's a bad example. I always consider in, from what vantage point are you going to look at it the majority of the time. I'll give you another, remind me to talk about those doors as well. Next, Frick. Good questions, by the way. Um, Vincent Esposito, if you are... I've, I've asked him if he's related to Phil. If you're gluing it to MDF or Baltic birch plywood and the veneer is an eighth inch or thicker, do you need to worry about wood movement? Well, that's a, that's a good question that I cannot answer for you. And I don't know whether that, uh, at some point that has to come into play. After that eighth inch that I saw online. Yeah. Is that what they were talking about? After an eighth, it's kind of behaving as its own piece of wood. Ah, good question. So uh, you didn't hear Chris talk in the background. But he said that's why when he looked it up, it said after an eighth of an inch, that wood is going to start acting like a piece of wood. There's going to be enough material there that the expansion is going to become an issue. So that leads me into this. These doors So my tool cabinet is all bird's eye and mahogany. So I had some really nice what would we call ribbon stripe mahogany. And that, ven that veneer, I still got some up there. That's a full 16th of an inch. So uh, I got a big gouge in it. So this, Jake, do you remember? What's the thickness of this? Must be five eighths. It is. So this started off as a piece of five eighths MDF. So what you're looking at is mahogany glued to a piece of 5 8 MDF and glued on both sides and then just added a bird's eye band on the outside. 
and at a sixteenth of an inch, if there was going to be a problem, it would break apart these joints, and it hasn't. So I would say I would say comfortably up until a sixteenth of an inch, you don't have to worry about it. You get beyond a sixteenth of an inch, and then you, there's just, there's an issue. So you got to bear that in mind. That would be like gluing a solid. Uh, I mean, like they said, after an eighth of an inch, it's like gluing on a solid piece of wood to something that's not going to move, and you're going to ask, you're going to invite problems. Good question. Next, Frick. Uh, Daniel Elsie says. Hey, Daniel. What are the worst woods to use for veneers? Worst. Well, I, I wouldn't use I wouldn't use any wood that uh, that didn't turn my crank. Why go through the Why go through the hassle if it wasn't worth it? Is there any wood? I would ex I would ex think some of the exotics, just because they're so hard to cut. And if you're in Australia, then you have to pay attention to that. They're so hard to cut that uh, just hard on the band saw, hard on the table saw, just difficult to work with. Anything that's brittle, uh, that again would bring exotics in. I can't think of any domestic hardwood that I would avoid. So any of your maples, walnut, cherry, birch, ash, any of those, not an issue. I just, I would, I would think that the uh, difficult ones would be the ones when you start getting into exotic woods and they're, they tend to be brittle. Stuff you wouldn't want to make a baseball bat out of. Next, Rick. Uh, this is another one from Daniel. He says, after resawing stock into veneer, is there a way to smooth it easily without damaging it? Yeah, I just showed you. Take your piece of MDF. Put that self-adhesive sandpaper on there, layer, and then lay it right on there, and you plane away like it was clamped between two bench dogs. Works beautifully. I, I, if you didn't, you go back to the beginning of this, and you'll see when I went in and I, and I planed this, uh, and that's fiddleback ash, but it was, it was entirely doable, and that stuff is about a sixteenth of an inch thick. So yeah. Uh, Gary in Ventura. Hi, Gary. What type of bandsaw blades do you suggest for reselling veneers? So, we are we using all stereo now, Jake? Yeah, I've been using stereo for four years. When I when I, when I first bought, uh, not when I first bought, but I bought a Laguna bandsaw back in two thousand and four, I think. And it came with uh, what they called the re. I think it was the Resaw King. It was a carbide. Uh, blade specifically designed for a resaw. Well, I hated it. It never, it never worked well. It was terrible. They sent me another one as a replacement, and it was no better. So I never had any luck with it. I use. I mean, if you're going to resaw, so you essentially it's a big rip cut. You want a low tooth per inch. I mean, uh, two or three teeth per inch. I wouldn't want any finer than that. Um, I don't know if anybody makes a bandsaw blade that is actually specifically a rip or a cross cut, but I cut them. I mean, there are those, there are people that like wider, thicker blades and it'll help it track. It depends on how much you're doing, I suppose, if you want to invest in something like that. So I would stay away from the little thin blades, like a, a quarter inch, although you can do it if it's a small piece, but if you're gonna do some serious resawing through eight inch or wider boards, you probably want to go with a three quarter inch blade that's and a low tooth count, so it's cutting and lots of room in the gullet to hollow out that sawdust. And as far as brand goes, we've uh, we switched to a stare it and we have great luck with them. Next, Frick. Uh, next one comes from Adam Fisher. He says, hey, Is clamping necessary if using hide glue with a veneer hammer? I uh, can't answer that. I've, I don't think I've ever used hide glue. I've seen it used, but <clears throat> I, and, and what he's referring to is uh, hammer veneering where instead of clamping it, you're, you're using a hot glue, which is hide glue is always hot, and you're using a, a, a kind of a weird shaped hammer and you're, you're pulling that and it's pulling the air bubbles out and sucking the two pieces together and I guess that's the way it works. And as it cools, it, it uh, solidifies. 
And I can't say that with surety because like I said, I have never done it. I've always used uh, regular wood glue with the exception of big veneer projects. I'm using two parts because you need the extra, the extra open time in order to get everything situated. You don't want that stuff starting to dry on you before, or starting to tack up before you start to, or before you get everything in place. Next, Frick. Jay Yo Yosis in uh, Cincinnati. Hey, Jay. What type of glue do you recommend for veneering? Uh, I use Type on 3 for almost everything as long as it isn't too big. When I, what's too big? Well, that top of, of this, the top of this box measures about uh, 10 inches by 10 inches by 14. But you got to remember, you're going, you're do, you have to do both sides. So how long is it going to take you to glue both sides? I don't glue the, I don't put the glue on the veneer. I put the glue on the substrate. You put it on the veneer and it's thin and it starts to suck in that moisture and curl. So I glue the substrate put it in place, clamp it up. I would use regular Type Bond 3 for that. It, I'm trying to see if I've got anything in here that is big enough that would qualify for... Uh, what do we use on this, Jake, on these doors? Did we use regular Type Bond on that as well? Yeah. I think we did. It would have to be a fairly large piece that's going to take me more than 15 minutes to get all the glue on and everything in place, and then I would switch to... Uh, any kind, any glue that gives you an open time of say 30 minutes or more. So the only one that I've used extensively is made by, do we have it here? We do. Yeah, Chris, Travis, it's in that, it's in that cabinet right below the red toolbox. It's in the back on the shelf. It's got a little picture of a boat on it. You sure it's in there? Yep. Really? All right, you're about to get your answer. Here comes Chris sporting that 757 shirt. What a nice one. I love the way they feel. Go see Kim, get yourself a shirt. So this is what I use. It's circa 1850, plastic resin glue, marine grade, waterproof meaning you can use it below the water line. So you could use it to uh, on the hull of a boat. It's made in Canada, so you know it's got to be good. Um, anything in particular? Don't get in your eyes, don't get in your skin or your clothing. Uh, see what it tells for open time. So, oh yeah, let me do tell you, if you do buy this, I learned this one the hard way. You always mix the powder into the into the water, you never mix the water into the powder. If you mix the water into the powder, you just may as well throw it away. It mix, it's terrible to mix. You want a power mixer? So you get your water and you're just gradually adding the powder or else it gets all, you just can't get rid of all those clumps. Um, Pre-catalyzed plastic resin glue forms a high strength water resistant bond. This is stronger than the wood itself. Any good glue is. Once cured, it is resistant to fungi, bacteria, oil, gasoline, most solvents, bonds wood, part plywood, particle boards, ideal for veneering, laminating, edge gluing, chopping blocks, cutting boards, and countertops. So another good reason to use a waterproof glue, obviously. Uh, just gonna see if it gives you the open time. For best results, temperature, uh, so you wanna be above 20 degrees Celsius, in other words, you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure the surfaces to be bonded are clean, dry, free from wax or oil. Um, do not use containers or tools made of copper to mix the adhesive. Obviously, there's something going on in there. So it says dissolve two parts of powder into one part of water. So it's a one to two ratio. Mix thoroughly to a syrup consistency. So when you're done, think of maple syrup. That's the consistency you want, which would be the same as most of your, most of your regular wood glues. Now, here's what it tells you. Once mixed, the, once mixed, the mixture begins immediately, curing immediately. The mixture has a pot life of four hours at 20 degrees Celsius. And the hotter the temperature, the, uh, it drops down. 30 degrees Celsius, you've only got one hour. That means 
You've already mixed it up, now you've got one hour to use it before you've lost it. Average pressure for a period of five hours. Now apply even pressure for five hours. So your clamping time is gonna be five hours in 30 degree temperatures, 12 hours in 20 degree temperatures. So room temperature, 12 hours of clamping. Tells you how much to, uh, tells you how much, what was I about to say? Oh, how many square feet you can get out of a container. It's cold, well, it's not cold waterproof until after 48 hours of curing. It doesn't say, it doesn't say the open time on here. But I'm gonna say, I'm gonna suggest that the uh, pot life is probably, what, uh, what I noticed too is you put this on a big surface, it's going to start drying out or absorb, the moisture is going to start absorbing in and it's going to start to skim over. So you, you don't want to leave it a long time. I would have, whenever I would do any kind of thing like this, I would have everything set up so that all I had to do was put the adhesive on, put the two pieces together and slide it in. Make sure your clamps are there, make sure everything is ready to go. Just leave, add it, putting the glue on should be the last thing you do before the two pieces meet. And what do we do? Is it, do we usually brush this on or trowel? You can do, or I, I used to, the only bad thing about brushing is it just seems to take a lot more effort. But if you get a notch trowel that's got a 16th inch notch, maybe even a 32nd of inch notch, you can apply that on there and it goes on so much faster. That's what's, and we do a lot of veneer, when we do our benches, essentially you're veneering and you're gluing up a whole bunch of pieces of MDF. And Kevin, what do you use over there, Jake? What's the glue we use? Uh, Type Bond 2 Extend. It's called Type Bond 2 Extend, and it supposedly gives you extra open time. But we use a notch trowel on that. So here's a tip out of this. Your best bet for a large surface is to use a notch trowel, because you can go in there and you can, you can carry with you the puddle of glue, and then once you're done, you realize you've got a lot to get rid of, you can just take it off the end. If you're using a brush, then you gotta go in there and add another step to the process of getting rid of the excess glue that you put on. Remember, once you start, once you get the glue on, it starts to, the moisture starts to get sucked out of it into the substrate, and it's gonna start to skim over on you, and you're gonna lose that tack that you're looking for. So everything you can do to speed up the process is gonna be in your favor. Good question, next one, Frick. Uh, Matt Herb in Florida. Hi, Matt, we're coming, hey, just stop right there. So, uh, if you haven't already heard, we're going to be in Florida. I'm going to be in Florida for uh, dates, please, Frick. Uh, we're going to be in Orlando at the Woodcraft store on March. Drum roll. Uh, 20, Friday, Saturday, right? Yeah. 29th and 30th. 29th and 30th of March. So on the 29th, we're doing a uh, seminar, an all day seminar, which includes your lunch, on everything hand planes. From setting up your planes, the biggest focus will be sharpening. Using your plane, using a shooting board, everything to do with planes in the workshop, in the shop. And um, I know they're getting close on, on it's almost full. On fr Saturday, we're going to do an all day dovetail seminar. The, for the morning will be through dovetails. The afternoon will be half blinds, and uh, that includes your lunch as well. So if you're interested, if you're interested in that, contact the Woodcraft store in Orlando for those dates. The next weekend, which is going to be the fifth and sixth of April, fifth and sixth of April, I'm going to be doing the same thing at the Woodcraft store in Clearwater Beach. You can contact the Clearwater Beach Woodcraft store in order to get into that deal. And again. Hand planes on hand plane everything hand planes on Friday, everything dovetails on Saturday. Next, uh, Frick, do you want to read that guy's question now from Florida? Yeah, it's Matt's. Uh, Matt he says, "What I'll is the maximum there. thickness you would use to veneer something like a drawer face?" Pardon? What's the maximum thickness you would use to veneer something like a drawer face? What's the maximum thickness? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go with what what. Well, actually, if you're gluing, if you're gluing. This, this grain is running this way. If I'm gluing it onto a piece of wood running the same way, then I don't, there's no worries. Do whatever you want. Um, if you're trying to hide the, hide the joint line, well, 
if I glue, if I glue an eighth inch piece on here and I use an eighth inch radius, that radius will help to hide that glue joint. So that would be my only stipulation. Like I said, it's the thicker the pieces, the easier it is to handle. But you're still gonna, even if it's a, even if it's a quarter of an inch thick, you're still gonna need a call to spread the pressure out. So that doesn't change. So I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a limit that way. Is Sue B on tonight? Mm -hmm. Sue, make sure we reserve some chicken. Jake, let's say hello to some vets. So these are combat wounded veterans that deserve our huge tip of the hat and anything we can do to help them, like the Purple Heart Project. Which, by the way, I, I should announce this. Um, so we now have thepurpleheartproject.org, which is <clears throat> the fundraising and the managing side of this. And it's the, it's the 501c3 in the U.S., soon to be in Canada. And uh, we just received a big donate. It's our biggest single corporate donation to date, 42000 Just recently, $42,000. So you can check it out, who gave that to us. That was very generous of them. And that was some hard work. I think Jack, no, actually, who, who one, of, one of our bench brigade members in initiated that. And if Jack's on, mm. if he can tell us. He's the first builder. Oh, we got, <clears throat> he's done eight of them? That he, need, that he needs a shout out. Jack, if you're here, please uh, text us so we, can, so we can tell everybody who that is. We need, uh, we need eight of those. Actually, you know what? It's our responsibility. It's nice that the corporations kick in, but it's really, a, this, is a, this should be a grassroots. This should be every North American, in particular, actually anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world, that benefits from the, uh, those who have put it on the line for our freedom. <clears throat> we need to uh, show our support. Frick, did that question ever get asked, or did I keep interrupting you? No. What was the question? Yeah, it was the one from Florida. A glue? What's the maximum thickness you'd use oh, on something thickness. like a drawer face? Oh, yeah. oh I, sorry. I asked Jake to read us out some vets. Who do you have, Jake? Uh, is this where I'm going to read one and you're going to say something? About Maybe. You're going to tell the same story every week? <laughs> Maybe. You're the only ones that hear it every week. Okay, Sean, I won't say anything. Sean Bumbles. Hi, Sean. Phil Lawrence. Hi, Phil. Wally. Hi, Wally. Pete Ambrose. Hi, Pete. Ray Dorr. Hi, Ray. Cool, Ray. Brent Nelson. Slowest dub till in the world. Hey, right. Uh, now, Brent, Brent's Brent. actually working with the Purple Heart Project now. Yes, he is. Big, big shout out I there. He's a working volunteer. There's several of them right? are. I just read that the other day. I had no idea we had so many ex, uh, ex, uh, um, what do we call them? PHP alumni that have stepped up to the plate. Brett's doing it to help increase his speed. Gave you a big shout out, Brett, on our... Uh, on the uh, video that we did to announce this new class. You have to see it. Anybody else? Uh, Jeff O'Connor. Hi, Jeff. John Bag. Hi, John. Michael Miller. Hi, Mike. Jonathan Sidney. Jonathan Sidney. Sid. Oh, Sid. Why do you call him Jonathan Sidney? That's what I call him. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Smear. Hi, Kev. Brother. Hi, Tim. That's Just looking at the Christmas card Tim sent me. I, think I kept it. I don't always keep Christmas cards, but I kept his. Big shout out to Angie. She's watching. This is Angie. This is Kevin's, Ken, Ken's cousin, who she and her sister Lynn do all of the Purple Heart t-shirts. So uh, when you get them and they're nicely packaged, it's probably the nicest packaging that we have. What are you laughing yeah. about? Hi, Angie. Somebody... Kyle just texted me and said that Jake Cosman from Newfoundland is watching too. Jake Cosman from Newfoundland? So He put my name in with his email last time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Kyle, who also helps with the PHP, is up in Newfoundland, and they just got slammed. How much snow did they get? Three feet. How many, how many millimeters is that? 450 millimeters. 450 millimeters. We don't, we don't do... 
We don't do snow millimeters, we do it in centimeters. centimeters. 45. So 45 centimeters of snow, a little uh, late in the f late winter <laughs> present. We don't have any. How do you like oh, that? Rick Schmied. Hi, Rick. Was the guy, was the guy oh, that Rick was the one that yeah. arranged that. Thank you, Rick, if you're watching. That was fantastic of you. So I wish we, we I, I, you know what? We got to get him on and just have him tell what he did that led to this because this is a, uh, and the other, the really good thing is these people are, uh, may very well be annual uh, oh, donators. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What? Kyle just said, that was, I was wrong when I said 45 centimeters. It's way more than that. Yeah, because 45 centimeters would, on, would no, only be would less than two feet. Nine, it should have been nine, 90 centimeters. 90 centimeters. Yeah. 90 centimeters of snow. He's still shoveling. He may or may not see his ground before July. Looks good on you, brother. I have some wonderful ointment here if you get sore muscles from shoveling. Any, any more vets? So, Frick, let's, uh, let Jack, let's, Wait. let's get. I got it. Let's get Rick. Okay. Uh, Brent Nelson is also giving us the donation tallies on the night. And we're sitting just over 3,500. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Brett. They must have been inspired by your, your super slow dovetail. It's inspired a lot of people. It's an excellent dovetail. Very methodically assembled. How's that? That sounds better than slow. Next, Frick. Are you... What are you doing? I'm reading the text from Jack. Oh. He said Rick Schmidt from Houston was the Brent Brigade volunteer that made the contact with the Stella Nova Foundation. Stella Nova. $42,000 donor. Rick is also Rick also built our first bench for Chris Kosum. Chris Kosum. Chris. Chris, we had Chris back here. He came up and uh, was my assistant. Just a super guy. Chris was uh, retired Delta Force. So that's some of the elite uh, army. Next, Frick. Uh, Mike Evans in Powell, Tennessee. Hi, Mike. I have some beautiful old walnut burl veneers. Any tips for working with old brittle pieces? Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to get yourself a... What, what, is, what does he want to get himself, Jake? One of the world's greatest spritz bottles. World's greatest spritz bottles. Fill it with water, not hone right. And just lay your veneer out and just do spritz it. You can soak it. Spritz it on both sides, get it wet, and um, as soon as it starts to absorb moisture, don't worry about it, because it'll dry up really fast. So there's, there's two different types of moisture in wood. There's bound and free, free water and bound water. The bound water is the stuff that's inside the cell wall or is inside the cell? It's inside the cell wall. I gotta remember all this, it's been a long time. And that's the stuff that you get out when you, when you kiln dry. The stuff that's in the cell, that, that, you know, you get it wet, it's there, you get it dry and it's gone. But it's the cell wall that has to get out in order for it to be stable. So you can soak it on both sides. And then once it gets pliable, depending on how big it is, I would just lay a, sh I would lay a, I would, on a surface that's not going to be affected by the moisture, lay down a piece of paper towel, that blue paper towel, because it's pretty absorbent stuff. Lay your veneer on top. Put another layer of paper towel. And then just take a piece of, uh, you know, MDF and lay it on top. Or you might want something waterproof. So melamine would be even better. Lay it on there and just let the weight of that. And over after a, an hour or so, I would just start to put a little bit of pressure on it to clamp, to, to uh, you know, press it nice and flat. But once you add the water, it should become pliable enough that it'll, it'll change its shape without splitting. Good luck. Next, Frick. Uh, Gary Stevens in the chat says, can you use strips of veneer or a patchwork of veneers to cover a larger surface? Yeah, so then you're going to want what's called veneer tape. So this is veneer tape. It's really thin. It's perforated. It's got adhesive on one side. So you you know just, just you can just run it over a water, uh, water activated. Yeah, well, just run it over, you know a wet sponge, and just pull it over like that, and it's it's quick stick. 
So if you're putting two pieces of veneer together, now I would actually go in and I would I would do it like this. You want a good joint. I would go in and I would stick it here, pull it across like that, and stick it and I would go about every two or three inches. And then I would come back and I would do another one right along the joint line. And th th it's really easy to sand this stuff off or to scrape it off after the fact, but it will hold your, your pieces together. So that, and that veneer tape, I think that came from Woodcraft. If you're looking for a source for it, I'll just tell you in a second. Mm, made in Germany. I think it did come from Woodcraft, but you should, you can find it on, you can find it on the internet, veneer uh. tape. The, now, the reason you don't want to use masking tape, the minute you put clamping pressure on masking tape, it almost makes it permanent. It becomes a very difficult to get off after the fact. That stuff's not. Next, Rick. In fact, yeah. some of this, uh, I think. Well, there's, there's, there's veneer tape that they've put on this just to try to hold it together, the joint line. And then once you put it on, it easily comes off. It's not hard to deal with at all. Next, Frick. Do you have something to say, Jake? It sounded like you were going to start something. Oh, uh, I was. Yes, sir. Um, Rick Schmid also built Ray Doors bench. Oh, yeah. How many did he do total? I think six. Wow. I think, is he the one that's got the record for the most? No, I'm pretty sure Jamie Fagel does. It's neck it's and neck. Close. So Ray Dorr was a World War, uh, pardon me, uh, World War II, sorry, Ray. We, Ray Dorr was a Vietnam vet who specializes, specialized in driving the mule. Look that up. Ray is a super um, guy. Jack was? He and, he and, uh, he and, um, um, Pete. Pete Ambrose were in the class together. Two two Vietnam vets sat side by side in the back. That was it. That was a special class. I both those guys. I uh, I honestly say I love those guys. Uh, Jack would like to know if you can buy, if you can use a larger vacuum bag for smaller projects. Yeah, you just can't use a smaller vacuum bag for larger projects. Next, Rick. Larry Robertson in the chat says, when veneering solid... Hi, Larry. Larry's up in... Uh, Larry's in... Uh, where? I don't know. Con no, I no. Larry's in uh, Har Harrow. Harrow, Ontario. Larry's a good friend of mine. Known him for a long time. When veneering solid wood, do you use a sheet of bland veneer cross-grain under the decorative veneer layer? Uh, say that again. A sheet... When veneering solid wood, do you use a sheet of bland veneer cross grain under the decorative veneer layer? No, no, I didn't. I mean, they. So the grain on this is running this way. The grain on this piece is running that way. And I don't know if they did that on purpose. I, I guess it would only make sense if you're if you're doing it for stability purposes. The same reason they do it on plywood. I, all those pieces over there I know look like that. I didn't do that, and and I wouldn't. Uh, there would be no reason to do this before you glue it onto something. What they've done with that is just to make this more manageable as a piece purchased like that. In other words, here's, here's a thin piece of brown oak. So I wouldn't cross grain. I wouldn't glue another piece on before I glue that on the substrate. That would just go right onto the substrate without a problem. Same, same with all of these pieces. Next, Rick. Uh, this is another Grumbles. Another? Yeah, he submitted quite a few. Hey, don't we have a limit? Do we have a limit mm. for Sean? <laughs> uh, between MDF and now Baltic. Now grumbling. Between MDF and Baltic Verge Ply, which is your favorite for veneering substrate and why? Where, between Baltic, which one? Between MDF and Baltic. Oh, MDF, point. always. M, the, the advantage of MDF, and I know some people don't like it, but too bad. It just has to be used in a proper, don't build your boat with it. So here's a piece of water-resistant MDF. Actually, this probably is as well. The advantage is, 
Jake, let's let's do a real real time. So I, I have no idea. This is just a piece that was in the garbage bin. Actually, I'm going to take a piece of one inch, one inch uh, Baltic birch. And we're going to measure it and see. Maybe I'm all wrong. So these pieces are relatively close in size. What I was going to say is what I like about this is that stuff tends to be very uniform. So here's a piece of one inch Baltic birch that measures nine, nine two zero. It's gonna take a minute, so bear with me. Where's my... Uh, you want the big one. I want the sharp, the sharp ear right here. So we'll do, we'll do six places. So this is nine, two, zero. We'll go to the middle. Squeezing it. So that's nine, two, one and a, one, five. Nine, two. Getting into the half that One, five. Well, if we can measure it, we can. Go right here in the end and I'm squeezing like this. This is nine two zero. We'll go down on this side. This is nine eighteen. Nine one eight should be point. And this is nine one six. Now I'm wiggling it so that I can take up anything, any any movement. Nine one eight. So we vary from point nine one six to nine two one. Point nine two one five two one five. So there's four or five five point five thou difference in thickness on that piece that measures nine inches. Ten by ten by six. So here's a piece of oh, I'm just gonna use this piece. I could use that piece because it was the same. I'll use this one, this one I was planning on. So let's check this. This is one zero seven. That's not right. What? Zero zero seven. No. That would be that would be one seven zero. That's one zero seven. No. Come on, sunshine. No. This is 1.06. That's a 10th hour difference, by the way. What? That's a 10th hour difference. Well, I'm measuring in thousands of an inch. This is one zero, <coughs> this is one zero seven. One zero seven. Ten thousandth of an inch difference, not ten, not ten thou. Well, I'll be really picky here, and this is point one uh, one zero six five, and then we'll go out here. One zero seven. Here's the reason why I like MDF. So we have a difference of one thousandth of an inch. 0 0.001 is the difference in thickness on that piece, which happens to be bigger than that, versus 5.5 thou. So this is always going to be more uniform in thickness. So if you want a really good substrate, the MDF is the best. Now that you can buy water-resistant MDF, 
that eliminates most of the uh, concern. of the concern of the uh, yeah the, uh, you know people always say oh, MDF terrible blah 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 and the water resistant MDF is how many times stronger than regular MDF considerably Three. so I I don't know if I could break that. I don't want to try, but I think I would have a hard time breaking that. I certainly wouldn't be able to break this. So tell me where the difference is. As a substrate, that's going to give you the most accurate. This isn't. This, because by the time they glue that all up and they pass it through a sander to bring it down to thickness, it's, that's how much it varies in that small a piece. So you can imagine over a big piece. So that's why I like it. Next for it. Uh, Derek Robertson wanted to Hi, Derek. know what's the maximum thickness you would cut the veneer to go over an interior house door? The maximum thickness I would go to an interior house door? Mm. You know, I, I, I mean, a sixteenth of an inch just is, is a nice thickness to deal with. It's got, a, it's got enough uh, strength that you don't have to worry about it falling apart when you're trying to move it around. So... And then you don't have to, I wouldn't go beyond that eight for that reason Chris was talking about. That's when it starts behaving like a piece of wood and there's enough of the material that it, it absorbs or shrinks, it's gonna crack or, or uh, expand and break something. So I say a 16, 16 seems to be a really nice thickness of veneer. It's hard for them to slice it. I know there was a place in Montreal that made that cherry veneer I had. And they said the whole building shook when they were slicing that off at a 16th of an inch. Next for Devin writes on Hey Devin, Devin's a, Devin is uh, Devin and Luther take care of all of the tracking the vets. Once we've notified them and said that they're coming to our class, they do all of that work. So big kudos, big thank you to both De uh, Luther and Devin. Uh, this one's from the chat from Michael Johnson. Luther answered it, but uh, I'll let you answer it as well. Uh, he's from Woodbridge, Illinois. He says, I'm new to my bandsaw and get blade drift when cutting veneer. Any thoughts? Yeah. So the, the problem with a bandsaw blade is uh, w the minute you start to cut a curve on it, you're, you're wearing a little bit of the set, mind it's not much, off of one side or the other. So now when you're making a straight cut, if you're using your fence and you've got a little more set on one side than the other, then the blade is going to drift. So we did a video on, on eliminating blade drift, and it's just as simple as drawing a straight line on a piece of wood and then making a cut through the bandsaw blade until you get the angle just right so that the blade is tracking and following the line. And then you stop and you match that angle that the board is with your fence so that now your fence, instead of being at parallel to the blade, it's parallel to the way the blade tracks. And then it's a lot better. But in addition to that, you have to have the right amount of tension. If you don't have enough tension, the blade's not gonna stay nice and straight inside the board. Because remember, it's gonna be hitting um, hard grain and soft grain, hard grain, soft grain. So it's gonna wanna follow the path of least resistance. And the less tight it is, the more it's gonna do that. The more pressure you put on, meaning you're, you're really pushing that, bo that board into there, you're gonna cause that blade, it's choking under the pressure, and it's gonna wanna go to wherever it's the least resistance is encountered. So um, you'll get a feel for it. I, I don't think there's a way you can actually explain that. You'll just, you just have to do enough of it until you get a feel for it, and you know your bone bandsaw when you're pushing too hard. I know you said you're brand new with this, so you got some lessons to learn on that, but. Watch that, Luther hopefully put a link up on the video we did on, on eliminating drift on your bandsaw. Now, a lot of people argue that bandsaw blades today are so accurate, you shouldn't have to worry about that. That's fine when they're new, but once they've been used, then that's not so true anymore. And if you're serious about resawing, then save a blade that all you do is you use that for, for, uh, for resawing. Don't use it for anything else. And make it and make sure it's wide enough, wide enough so that it'll give it a little bit of, of uh, it, it'll increase its ability to track, and because it's wider, you can actually have the blade more taunt. So, a couple things there to consider when you're band sawing. Next, Frick. Richard in the chat says, "Is veneer flexible enough to wrap around a post without it splitting?" 
Well, you can always add moisture to it. Remember, I mean, don't worry about it. That's, it's not like it's, you're not reintroducing moisture into the cell wall. So you can add moisture to it, steam it, whatever you need to do in order to get it to form. I would even say you could put it on with, with a higher moisture content. That'll all come out when you're uh, in, in very short time. Uh, Jeff Shanab in the chat wants to know if, Hi, Jeff. if the TPI is too fine, does the buildup of sawdust cause drift? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's also going to cause the blade to heat up. Because remember, your blade will lose some of the heat with the sawdust being exhausted as well. And you want to, you want, the, that's the nice reason about having few TPI because you got a big gullet. And that's where all the sawdust accumulates as the tooth is cutting. So smaller the gullet, the less the tooth is able to actually cut. Again, your pressure you're applying is going to cause that blade to, to wander. So let's review that one more time. Sharp blade, yes. Low TPI, bigger gullets, faster cutting. A wider blade, stiffer, you can put more pressure on it to keep it nice and straight and taut. And you want the fence to be matched to the blade's uh, track line, not to the blade itself. Now, they may both be the same, but it's more important that the fence be parallel to the way the blade tracks, that line that it cuts on. Next, for uh, Manny K in the chat. <clears throat> he says, I'm, hey, trying, I'm trying to make veneer out of a piece of wenge. Wenge. Wenge, yeah. W-E-N-G-E? Yeah. And there's a nasty black stain in the sapwood that goes all the way through the wood. How do I get rid of it? I tried oxalic acid with no luck. Okay, I'm trying to, a lot of information. Say that again, please. So he's trying to make a veneer out of it. Trying to make a veneer out of a piece of wangi. Yeah, and there's a nasty black stain in the sapwood that goes all the way through the wood, and he wants to know how to get rid of it. Shoot, I haven't got a clue. And it's a naturally occurring black stain that's in the sapwood? I've never seen wangi with sapwood. I've never seen wangi sapwood. So if it's in the wood, I, I, I think you're going to think you, the only thing to do is get a different piece of wood. I don't know how you'd ever get rid of a naturally occurring black stain in the sapwood. Don't have an answer for you on that one. Sorry. Next, Frick. I'm out of questions. You are? Yeah. Oh, I want to give them an update on the, on the advice before we're almost out anyway. So uh, just to uh, bring you around on this, we decided, when, how long have we been at this? Has it been a year? Mm, three months. Three months. We decided. That, so if you don't know what the online workshop is, Jake and I started this, and, and Frick, actually. The three of us started this in 2011, Frick? Yes. That's when the bandwidth grew to the point where you could do this. And it was actually uh, John, uh, a friend of mine, John in New York, John Peckham, that convinced me to do this. So what we do is we teach you how to build furniture online. It's a membership-based thing. If you're a combat wounded vet, you get it for free. We produce three 45-minute episodes every week. We take a few weeks. We allow for the weeks that we're teaching. And um, we walk you through the process from design right through to applying a finish. So the latest project is a tool cabinet that we will then fill with tools. You guys will. This is where you get to participate. And uh, you guys will be able to donate whatever tools you want. When we're all done, somehow we're going to raffle this off or auction it off or something. And the proceeds will all go to the Purple Heart Project. So it's made out of walnut. Accent wood is um, aspen. And we are probably weeks away from having it completed. So I want to show it to you. Uh, if you. If you take a quick peek back there... That's the prototype that we started with. So we built a plywood prototype first. That way we could figure out where all the tools were gonna go. And we've actually veered from that a little bit as we've needed to. So I think the last time I showed you, this would have been done. I'll just recap it. So these, the chisels and the magnets are set in behind the wood so you don't actually see them. But the magnets are there to help hold them in place. And then there's a little, uh, there's a little hole down there for that to grab hold of the end of the handle. So you've got your squares, and again, there's magnets in behind. There's a little ridge on there, so when you put your, when you put your square on, 
it'll stay put, doesn't get, won't get knocked out. Your Kerfex 10, your marking gauges, your mallet, your combination squares in back. You've got your two steel rules. You've got your 12 inch steel rule sits into a little slot there and your six inch sits in a little slot there. This will be hinged in place. It's just sitting there right now. So here's our center section. This one we just recently completed. So there's your rip panel saw and your saw till comes out. So you can withdraw from its holster, put it back in place. Willie made us these little brass stays. I haven't trimmed this off yet so that it comes out and it locks in place. You can push it back in. Your cross cut saw is over here. Why this? Well, it allows a long saw to be stored and instead of having to pull it out this way, which would eliminate a lot of your available space in here, it comes out here out of the way and you get your saw. Um, our dovetail cross cut and medium tenons sit on here. So we have them stored according to their use. Dovetail saw is number one, joinery cross cuts number two, medium tenon is number three. And they all sit in there nestled in neatly. And then your little toggle switch goes over there to hold them in place. We've actually found a hammer that has a black handle, which just works, works with our color scheme. A little toggle on there, and your hammer comes out. We use a hammer for tapping our dovetails together, and because we're all so good, we don't need a big hammer. Uh, let's go down here first. So I wanted, I wanted to uh, set everything in leather just because when you put it in place, it just, it just softens the sound. So there's my five and a half sits. My three quarter inch shoulder plane sits in a leather area as well. And my block plane sits in leather over here. Now, I have, it has three drawers. Before we do the drawers, let's finish this. So Jesse Rufiange makes our, I called this a, a block plane the other night on the video we did. This is a drawer bottom plane. So the drawer bottom same plane sits in there. We have a small router plane that sits in that little pocket. Um, we, have, we have the fret saw. And this is a slope so that when that goes in and our coping saws in the back, same thing, it slopes so it drops down in and won't fall off. Now, you know how much I love my shooting board and you know how much I love the uh, grip that Jake designed. So we need to have a place for the grip. So there it is sitting right there. But this is also made in Canada by me, a Canadian, filmed by a Canadian, produced by a Canadian. So I wanted to have something Canada it's also all about the Purple Heart Project. So we have this, in pl this fits on the back or on the side. There's a little brass pin that fits in there to hold it in place. There's also a magnet to help hold it in place. So those were the two options I had for holding this in place. So we drilled a hole, but we needed something for the magnet to attach to. So what did we do? Well, we took a, 19, a 2014 Canadian quarter. So you got the maple leaf which was a commemorative thing with the poppy. That's what we, we wear a poppy on Remembrance Day. That says Armistice Day, 1918. And here's the problem. If you measure the outside diameter of a quarter, nobody has a drill that size. So how am I gonna set that in there so it's nice and flush? So I, got an, I had an idea. So I took a piece of holly, which is white. This, by the way, is birch. And I left the backs white so that it would brighten things up, make it easier to see. So I took a piece of holly and I turned it on the lathe and I hollowed out the center so that the quarter would fit in there. And then I turned the outside of that piece to match an inch and an eighth diameter drill. So I drilled a hole, set that in place. It's all sitting below the surface and you don't see it. It's very discreet until you take off the grip. Come on, get in there. There. You don't see it until you take off the grip and all of a sudden, oh, look at that. Now, the drawers. our drawers. So we have three drawers. Each drawer, all lovely, nice dovetail. Each drawer has a tray. The tray increases the capacity of the drawer. You put too much stuff in the drawer, you lose everything in the bottom. This way, you increase it. So cute little dovetails on there. So this one is divided into three. This one is divided into two. And this is a big one. All right? Now, we want to be able to lock these. These wings will be hinged and then they will close and be lockable. How do you lock your drawers? Well, we came up with a clever little idea. And, when, and now what we're gonna have right here, we're gonna take the mini adjuster. So we developed this, how many years ago, Jake? Five and a half. Could be, could be our most successful product ever. 
Now it would be hard to be competing against the dovetail saw. And that replaces that stupid round wheel that's so hard to turn. We had to do the mini for number fours and small narrow planes. So we're going to take a mini and we're going to thread it and that's what you're going to spin over here. So when you, when you drop this down, three brass pins go down and lock the drawers so you can't open the drawers. So they'll be nice and secure. Now I'll just show you real quick. If I wind that all the way up, it pulls them up. So there's they fall. There's a little brass in the little piece of brass inlaid in the back, and the pin falls into that hole, and that's what locks it in place. Intact lever. This one is in the middle, and this one over here is on the side. Last piece of the puzzle. We're doing this wing. We've got our winding sticks, our mallet, our brace, our flush trim, and our egg beater. So this slides into here. I haven't glued this piece in yet. You get a little finger recess in there so you can push that up out of the way in order to get it out. And then that sits in uh, that sits in a piece of leather as well just to soften the blow. That has yet to be glued in. There's a dowel that's going to go in here and it'll hold that. That fits in the hole so it doesn't swing side to side. This will sit down in here. There's got to be a, an area recessed out of here where the top of that will go in. Then there's a little heart-shaped piece that that will slide onto that will hold that in place. There's a slot back here for the flush trim, and there'll be a little piece in here, a little pocket, so you don't see that. The flush trim will just fit in there, and you'll pull it out like so. And then the brace is gonna sit in the middle. It'll be positioned like this, and that'll be sitting down lower, but that just closes into an open area anyway, so it's not a problem, but this will give us enough room we need for everything to fit in there all fancy smancy. Dovetails. Through wedge tenons, hold it to hold it together. Case is made out of walnut, beautiful piece. Somebody's gonna be really happy to get that. And we're gonna be happy to make a lot of money off it so we can fund our, our program for this year. It's right. a little over, little over $50,000 for each class. And last year we raised enough money only to cover two classes. We did raise enough to cover the airfare for the other classes but that left a big void, so we gotta ramp it up. And with right. that note, let's go. We, how many, we what, break, what's our total? We broke 4,000. We did, we broke, uh, we're at 4,030. $4,030? Correct. So I didn't tell you this, but we, we give away a prize for every three, th every, every thousand dollar increment in, in, uh, in donations that we receive. So what are we giving away tonight? Any suggestions, Jake? Oh, you know, well, let's give away some three-quarter saws. Same wavelength, too. Oh. So we're going to give away four of our three-quarter. This is our little dovetail saw. These are the saws that we, we uh, promote for doing small dovetails, like on that those little drawers. And, and uh, I'll tell you about it next, next time. But anyway, we do a cross cut, a little small cross cut, and a, and a dovetail. So we'll draw your name, and we, if you already have one, we'll give you the option of getting the other. So let's give away four of those. We're giving away three dead cat sweaters. And next time we film, which will be in two weeks. Uh, we're not sure about that yet, because that's the night before we go to... We leave for Florida early the next morning. Well, we're filming. We're filming. Can we start earlier, please? Oh, my word. No, come on, Frick. Sleep on the way. Sleep, sleep on the way, yeah. Yeah, I'll be driving, I'm sure. You're going to do anything for three weeks. Rest when you're there. So we're going to sponsor. We're going to bring that. We're going to highlight somebody else's business. I'll leave it uh, till the next week. And it's going to have on the, on the sleeve, it's going to have sp um, supported by RC Woodworking. You'll be able to get one of those t-shirts big shout out to kim o'connor she has a wonderful business she does excellent work if you have any need for uh t-shirts she'll help you even with your i think she helped you with your logo if you want i hope i didn't say that it's because of turn but she also has her 757 business but if you're looking for hats or any kind of promotional stuff she does a wonderful job and all of her customers rave about her service so and don't forget Kevin Burris, because if you want, if a date 
and your life is really important, that needs to be carved in stone. Check out BurrisWoodworking.com. These are all combat wounded vets or the wives of combat wounded vets who re deserve a Purple Heart or more for every one that their husband has. All right, three dead cats. Right. Here we go. Three dead cats. Ready, Frick? I'm drawing He's them trying now. to shut me up. Paul Francoeur, who asked a question earlier in Quebec, Canada. He's number one. Hey, Paul, you will love that dead cat up there in Quebec. Dan Mandic in Kitchener, Ontario. Well, Canadians, Dan, you'll need it in Kitchener, too. And the third is Richard Anderson, Waterbury, Connecticut, USA. All, all in the northern part of the hemisphere. Congratulations, congratulations gentlemen. We will. Uh, you need to contact Gina and let her know the size, and we'll have it in the mail for you this week. All right, four saws. Four saws. Saw, uh, this is these are three quarter dovetail. Saw number one. Saw number one's going to Steve Spry in Bidford, Devon, UK. Oh, Steve, you said Steve. Yep, Steve Spry. Yep. Over the UK. Hope you're still up. Enjoy it. Congratulations. Okay. Number two is Jocelyn Barber in Pennsylvania. Jocelyn in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Next one is Antoinette Asmar in Michigan. Antoinette in Michigan. Thank you. Appreciate your support. And the last one is John Reeder in Hearst, Texas. John Reeder has won before. He, he could be considered a very lucky man. Don't forget to email the Thanks, John. email address on the bottom of the yep. screen. Yeah, contact Gina so we know where we're sending it. We will see you in two weeks. Um, please be our eyes and ears. Look for those who benefit from our Purple Heart Project. Have them go to our website, robcosman.com, or thepurpleheartproject.org. You can find all the in information on there, how to sign up, how to register, and uh, let us help you. Okay? Don't forget, check out sleepinheavenlypeace.org. Actually, I think the website is shpbeds.org, or just go sleep in heavenly peace. Watch the clip by, uh, um, what was the guy, Dirty Jobs? Mike Holmes? Mike, not Mike Holmes, no. Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe, yeah, yeah. Mike Rowe did a video that I've watched it four times. It makes me cry every time I see it on what this does. We, we Ken and I just opened, and, and Al just are in the process of opening a chapter here, thanks to Dave in South Dakota. And it's, the whole purpose is to make beds for children that don't have a bed to sleep in. Something all of you need to be a part of. I promise you that. Check it out, please. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me. Having a good two weeks, and we'll see you in a bit.